Welcome to Issues That Matter. We're going to talk today about the impending famine throughout the world. And my guest today is Mary, uh, I'm sorry, Marsha Mary Baker and Dennis Speed. Uh, so, Marsha, why don't you start off? Okay. And I think that uh, we're in... The, what we're seeing unfolding is the process of an epic and historical famine unless we do something about it. And we can do something about it. That's the good news. It's totally wrong when you hear people say it's climate change that is dooming the earth because there are too many people and they emit too much gases and they get rid of biohabitats. Wrong. What we've had is decades of what you could politely call a food gap system in the internationally, where we, weren't, we were underproducing food anyway, and this very much characterized uh, what we've had for a half century based out of the city of London, Wall Street, where money was key, not physical necessities like food, heat, transportation power. Mm -hmm. So that's the problem and the dimensions are big. Do you know by Thanksgiving, we're gonna have 8 billion people in the world according to the official counters. Oh. And so we should be producing, take grains. Uh, it's a good measuring stick mm -hmm. in the realm of a half ton a year per person, that'd be 4 billion tons. So we're, we're, we aren't even producing 3 billion tons internationally. And then on top of that came the pandemic, the sanctions against Russia. That's where we are. Dennis, would you like to say something? Well, I just am reminded of the fact that, uh, you know, when we look at this issue of food and world food production, there was a time when the United States was the preeminent producer and the preeminent nation that was pushing the idea of feeding the world. It wasn't that long ago. It's something that many of us grew up with in the 1960s. And then in the 1980s, there was quite a bit of work. Uh, matter of fact, uh, in the 1980s, uh, there was an organization which Mr. Lyndon LaRouche was uh, uh, instrumental in founding at the time. It's called Food for Peace. Now, Food for Peace was an over kind of a generic name that had been used even from the 1970s and earlier. Uh, to, to sort of talk about a policy where you could go beyond politics, beyond division, and beyond war. And that whole outlook has been basically overturned. In fact, if you go back to Afghanistan, I think it was back in, I don't remember if it was, well, it was last year, uh, when David Beasley, who was uh, uh, the head of the World Food Program, a former Republican governor of South Carolina, was uh, at that time talking about the, the issue of feeding the various people who were the victims of the Afghanistan conflict. And he was talking about the fact that if you didn't move to begin the process of feeding what was at that time, 22 or 23 million people that he was working on, he was looking at Afghanistan in particular, that the problem just gets not only worse, but then it becomes logistically impossible to address any elements of the problem. And if you have a circumstance like that, let's just take our present circumstance in this country. Everybody is probably aware, maybe unfortunately aware, of the way in which these new sets of viruses, rhinoviruses, enteroviruses, these are respiratory uh, illnesses that have been spreading all over the United States. This is not coronavirus, but uh, or it's not the COVID-19. Uh, and its various variants. But the hospitals are filled right now with all sorts of people that are affected by that. If you put into that equation food insecurity uh, uh, or malnutrition or other factors, the ability to get a takeoff in multiple forms of epidemics, uh, and which become pandemic, then affects every part of the world. So this issue of food and using food as a weapon, not allowing food to be exported uh, to countries in need. Uh, this is a problem that's right at the root, really, of everything else that affects us in the economy. In fact, in the one, the one area that there was a slight amount of cooperation involving Russia was around the Russia, uh, Turkey, uh, and Ukraine 
a uh, deal to allow some of the grain to to leave. Maybe die, uh, uh, maybe something that Marsha may want to talk about a little bit, actually. Um, and even there, we're seeing pushback. We're seeing problems. And I think that um, if we take this area, just this one area, and create a circumstance where there's cooperation globally, what we're going to suddenly see is that this may be one of the primary mechanisms to address the issue of war and conflict. And we need to do that uh, before it's too late. I, I, I want to interject the thought. Uh, I'm not privy to a lot of the stuff you're saying, but what I've, I've been led to understand is that Bill Gates is buying up a lot of farmland Marcia, can you address that issue? Why is he doing that? Yeah, I can. I can tell you, it's in. He's a richy rich guy, um, Microsoft guy, and he's bought maybe two hundred, three hundred thousand acres in the United States. I don't know about abroad, but he's indicative. He's not the only one. Let me. Another guy is Ted Turner, the CNN richy rich guy. He owns a, a couple hundred thousand, probably, of ranch acres from Nebraska and, and Montana. And then you have someone you may not have heard of. There's a uh, Wall Street uh, trade uh, uh, richy rich guy named Stuart Resnick. And he and his wife, they own almost a couple hundred th thousand acres in California. And they are the king and queen of pomegranates and almonds, biggest in the world. So why do you have a situation like that where this is typical? Uh, and before I, or, or we all address that, let me just tell you about Ukraine. That has the same syndrome of these uh, billionaire or millionaire types. When the Soviet Union split up after the wall came down, and the world had the opportunity to work together. That's that's something we could talk about. But Ukraine, which has fabulous soil resources, the Black Earth Belt, Iowa has similar. What happened is a bunch of guys of the golden billionaire type mindset like uh, Bill Gates came in and they couldn't buy land outright because it was still held uh, by the state, the new state. So they aggregated a lot of thousands of acres into what they politely called agro holdings. That's a technical term. They couldn't say plantations, that has bad connotations. So there are huge agro holdings in Ukraine and uh, they have been run by uh, Ukrainian equivalents to many Bill Gates and it's hilarious, except it's disgusting. The, some Goldman Sachs guys bought some cowboy boots in London. They went to Ukraine and they became, you know, the king of the ranch. So we have a lot to clean up in the world. And it's an opportunity to do that as people wake up around the world. Farmers have been on the streets of Europe and others too, that with all the, this is all coming to a head multi-millions of people aren't going to eat and we can clean this up. That's the story of, uh, that's the partial story of Bill Gates. The other story is he's been policing the world against development. In 2006, Bill Gates and his foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation sent, set up a thing in Kenya called AGRA, Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa. And they were against uh, projects like uh, more water from the Congo River Basin, uh, dams, railroads. They said smallholder farming, women should run them. Who's, to, who's he to say what a country should do in Africa? But he's been doing it ever since. And I'll just uh, mention to Dennis that um, in 2021, before the, after the pandemic, but before the uh, Ukraine conflict, uh, the United Nations held a special food event. Dennis wrote a statement about it. Uh, the Director General Guterres presided. And who did he pick to run that event? Um, the head of Bill Gates, uh, Agra, 
Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, Dr. Agnes Kalabata. So it didn't address anything. Um, the reason why I'm so interested in this particular topic is I uh, there's a food co-op in in the city of Albany. And, you know, when you see a co-op, you see local first, local farmers, and so forth. So I'm concerned about the little guy, the local farmers. Um, are they going to be completely shut out of the whole picture? Yeah, New York State's lost half of its dairy farmers in the last 25 years. Half, maybe more. They're being shut out all over the de so-called developed uh, places of the world, like the US, Canada, Europe, and places like Afghanistan that Dennis mentioned, which by the way, has the same number of people as California. They, 98% of the Afghanis don't have enough to eat. Half of them are in a critical stage. And so logistically we got it, we can mobilize food from where it is in the world and grow more and save them but they haven't even been able to reach the productivity level of family farmers in New York state that are p being put out of business. So it's all one crisis right now. We're all in it together. So, so it, Dennis, let me just interject check this out. So it's not only the farmers that are being shut out, but it's also the people that are being starved. Am I correct? Yes. Okay, I'm sorry, Dennis. Go ahead. No, there's only no, there's no problem, Cynthia. I just wanted Marcia to take this opportunity to talk about something. Her uh, her husband Bob uh, often talks about this idea of a million farmers uh, in the United States, a million more farmers or new farmers. But in one sense, what his his point is, and Marcia, you should go through this, is that the family farm has always been the basis of the American food supply. That was the idea of our American independence and security in terms of food production. And even though we have less and less farmers as time went on in the United States, we were producing more and more food of a high quality. We're not talking about all the various manipulations that have gone on involving Cargill or some of the other large uh, agri-corporations. Uh, and, and that world has been largely destroyed, but there are things that could be done and need to be done in the United States to address, which if they were done, would actually address many of these food needs, but there's sort of a large speculative, financial speculate, speculative um, um, monster sort of sitting on top of it. Marsha, I just wanted, I wondered if you could go through some of what Bob says about this and your own thoughts about it. Yes, and the principles involved in family scale farming is what we also want to bring to anywhere, you know, we all can work on, even, for example, in Haiti. And we, you need to support a situation where you have uh, a family scale, a family literally, extended family, being able to have the inputs they need to farm. That'll mean the seeds, the fertilizer, the chemicals, being able to then, and to get started if they're young, not just to hope to inherit, but get started. Secondly, to have infrastructure around them, to have water systems that they can know they'll have water, to have defenses against disaster. It's not climate change causing all the problem, is that we haven't continued to build like flood defenses we once did in the Mississippi River. And third, you need constant science uh, drivers for new seed developments and other kinds of things like this and education and a steady income. So what we've had in the, what we need in the United States is an intervention to create these conditions. We once had them. Out of the 1930s, we had what's called parity pricing where farmers, different mechanisms made sure the farm family didn't go way up and down in income, boom or bust. And we got rid of those parity prices by 1970s. We need credit for right now, there's a crisis for the planting season in the United States when it takes to fertilizers. 
someone that bought a ton of fertilizer in August for $1,000 now has to pay $1,800 this month in two months. So we need uh, to, but what we, the reason you want the family scale farming is the farmer, his children, his neighbors, they're experts in chemistry, botany, biology, they can weld, they're metallurgists, they can do food processing. And th th this, is, uh, uh, th this is the front end. It's both food security for the country and it's the front end of a productive population that isn't all uh, done in by either, whether it's drugs or the entertainment culture. They're taking joy in producing to feed people for the future. And that requires financial changes like uh, ending this speculative system that's blowing out anyway with Glass-Steagall type reintroduction of re-regulation of banks. But um, we have a problem in the next few months. A lot of family farmers that, that you run into, Cynthia, in local food hubs or co-ops or uh, uh, they might be trying to re get loans again come January. And it, it, the thing is blowing out. If they don't get them, they go under. So there's been a blackout of all this, hasn't there? You don't know how many millions of people don't have food in the world, which is close to a billion, 300 million in a severe state. You don't know that even farmers in Europe have been on the streets. And the last thing you don't know is this going, this green agenda for the Green New Deal invites you to just say, well, let's kill people to save the planet. That's the most immoral evil thing of all. One of the things that, you know, I, I, I've recognized is the fact that people are becoming less and less able to buy basic, basic stuff that they need. And if I go down to the co-op, the catch word is organic. Well, if people don't have the buying power, they cannot afford to buy organic fruits and vegetables, which is more healthier than, you know, the spread stuff. So I'm looking at the fact that there's, st uh, people might purchase fruits and vegetables, but they're not organic, which is not healthy. So um, I think that's a problem also. The organic farmers, um, are they being shut out of this whole process? Yeah, they're farmers too. They're, of course they're being shut out and they have much lower productivity. You take a field, a stand of corn, if it's organic, that and that's just a catchword made up to mean maybe they didn't use chemicals to stop some rot right, or some bugs right, or insecticide. Right. So it's, it, it, so, so that, so the thing is it's across the board now, the scale of the threat to the US and the world food supply is so severe, um, it, it, take fertilizers. Organic might mean you only use chicken, chicken poop and, and, uh, uh, your swine lagoon instead of using nitrogen, phosphorus, or potassium. Mm -hmm. but it's all going. It's all going. You can, it, it, people can't afford to buy it, and it may not be there anyway to buy. And that's the state we're in. If you don't fertilize on a, a wheat and corn, you don't have to do so with nitrogen for soybeans. You'll lose, you can lose 10, 20% of your crop after a year or two because mm -hmm. the soil is depleted as well. So this is basic science. It's all coming together. We, as one farmer was telling Congress a week ago, I was in on a meeting with an Iowa farmer and he said, it can appear we have food now, but with it, because there's some stocks, it's, but in one season, you're gonna have shortages. Mm. Dennis? Yeah, I would just point something out. First of all, all food actually is organic, okay? I mean, now it's true that you can talk about the different levels at which you're using chemicals for this or that. And people say, oh, we're using chemicals. Yeah, of course you're using chemicals. It's called chemistry. 
Now, there is a misuse of anything that we can talk about, and that's not unimportant, but I just wanted to say something about this issue of food supplies. Um, many years ago now, this goes back 40 years, I was up in Albany, just outside of the city. I was meeting with a man who was a head of the, what was then called the Grange. It was one of the early farm organizations of America. And uh, what had happened was we were, I was there to talk to him about the idea of the American farmers working together with farmers in Sudan, the country of Sudan, uh, which was about the size of, of much of Western Europe at that time and had topsoil, which was something like, uh, well, let's put it this way. You could sort of drop things in the soil and they would grow. It wasn't literally true, but nearly literally true. But the problem was that there, there, were, there was a need to look at how you could develop disease resistant strains of cattle. Uh, there were a lot of things that American farmers were very familiar with that a lot of these weren't. Anyway, so what happened was I was going up there and he asked me what I would like to eat. So I simply told a joke. I thought it was funny. I said, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a vegetarian. So, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a Muslim, so I'm, I'm, I'm a vegetarian. I'm not a Muslim and I'm not a vegetarian. I just said this, right? Anyway, I get there. And what he's done is he has had prepared for me a series of things that are just all off the farm, you know, and I say, you know, I, I didn't really mean it, but he, it's already done. The corn, we had uh, some, some eggplant, we had corn, we had milk. It all tasted completely different than the food I was used to, all of it. Now, why? Because it was real. He, 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 and, and he was a local farmer. He was a, not a large farmer, but he wasn't small either. And what it meant to me was it reminded me of the 1950s when all around the towns that you'd have, I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania, from Chester, Pennsylvania, just south of Philadelphia. And my father had a garden which was two blocks from where we lived and he grew tomatoes and he grew other things and he would take me over there with him. I remember the shovel, rake and hoe. I remember this over and over. He had my, I had my own little shovel, rake and hoe and I would go with him. And we, he did it not because we had to have the food exactly, though it did help at that time. It was just a small thing. Now this is all, of course, very small scale. But the reason I'm taking going through this at this level, even though we're talking about a world problem, is that when I spoke to this farmer in Albany and talked to him about the Sudan problem, what he did was he put me in touch with another group of people in the state. Uh, these were some of these people, were the old American agricultural movement people, uh, uh, Marsha. And we, we, we had a seminar. I brought farmers who came to me through the United Nations up to the Syracuse Binghamton area. And we began mapping out at that time, you know, how this project could go ahead. This is the kind of thing that the American people would do, just like you see with fire farmers, for example, in Iowa. And matter of fact, Marcia, you might want to tell that story about how Xi Jinping actually from China uh, spent all, a lot of time in Iowa, got to know a lot of the family farmers there. Uh, there's a way in which food and the idea of the production of food and the, and the participation in the production of food quickly sets right many problems that we're talking about, whether that's famine, whether that's disease, whether that's the lack of productivity in an economy, whether it's the idea of looking at uh, energy intensive farming, different methods, all of these things would be addressable by taking what is one of our most productive sections of any population and creating a dialogue among nations around this. So I, I just wanted to uh, just say that, just I was sort of thinking back in terms of why Marsh, when Marsha was saying what she was saying about the, the way in which this problem might allow us to address many others. Yes. Marcia? Yeah, that is so true. I'll give it uh, and uh, two, two quick points. One thing about the, the, the quality of food and the organization of the production in your country. When I say family size, it can be partnerships, farms. 
when when New York State lost all the dairy farmers and Pennsylvania was a big dairy state and so forth, what makes up the difference? Some people did switch to drink Diet Coke, not milk. I won't discuss that. But you had uh, deconstructed milk powder casein coming in from New Zealand and milk would be reconstructed into pizza cheese. You had uh, milk traveling 3,000 miles from California or Idaho from gigantic industrial milk herds. You didn't have the organic uh, droppings from the cow manure to put back in your soil of New York State. See, again, it's family scale farming. We need to restore that in the US and and, and have exchange support as Dennis was just talking about. And one, here's an example. You know, the Wall Street uh, uh, kind of uh, city of London system, four big firms account for all the meat processing in the country, the beef processing for sure, okay? Just four, 85% of all the meat processed. It comes from mega plants. And some farmers have taken the lead in ranchers, uh, like a man from Kansas, Colorado called Mike Calicrate. And he's developed alternate systems that can, that can supply places like the Albany Co-op or a food hub somewhere where you can be uh, slaughtering in a big mobile van type operation, several carcasses a day. It'll taste like Dennis said, great. It won't taste like something that was imported from, I hate to say it, meat's coming in from Western Africa where meat is needed into New England. And then it's repackaged and called USA and sold in uh, uh, supermarkets. Mm -hmm. So that tastes like it's tired meat. But the thing is, the same mobile vans that the man in Kansas and Colorado developed can be the things that we help support in Afghanistan, where there are sheep and cows, and they can those herds can be developed, and you can have decentralized but very high quality processing going on, get some transportation, it can serve the cities. And the exchange of expert experts on this is the basis for peace. Development concretely is the basis for peace and food is in the leading edge of that. You know, we as human beings or any other living thing, we can choose a lot of different things in which to live our lives. But the one thing is we, we, cannot, we cannot choose not to eat. We have to eat to sustain life. And that's why this is so important. Because if there's people starving or malnutrition or suffering from malnutrition, that's not good. I mean, I, we could talk about this for hours, but let, let, let's uh, talk about final thoughts. Dennis, do you have any final thoughts? Well, I'm just reminded, Marsha said this, and I'd just like to point it out again. If you look at the figures for what they say right now is the situation for world hunger. They talk about 828 million people nobody knows exactly the exact number, are going to bed hungry every night right now. Gotten food insecurity has gone from 135 million to 350 million since 2019, over the last three years. You're talking about 50 million or more people in 45 different nations that are teetering on the, on the edge of, of starvation. So this is an immediate problem, which requires an immediate solution. What we actually have farmers in the United States in particular, but, but many other places around the world. Uh, and she mentioned it, Netherlands, farmers are up in arms, Germany, uh, Italy, Spain. And what they're saying is, look, we don't want to hear about why we should not produce because you can't speculate on our food to make a profit uh, for some rich person already. We are prepared to be productive we demand to be productive. We don't want a cut in our productivity. The way we farm, we are ecologists, okay? We respect the land. We produce from it. And so we are in a situation where we may be able in the next weeks, I'm saying, weeks and months, to find that there's a form of international alliance, which if the producers, the farmers, 
are the leaders of that, it may actually create a kind of a shock of sanity in the world. We have got to get off this idea of conflict. Uh, it doesn't help us. Uh, when you have areas like Ukraine, which could be highly productive, they have to, uh, there has to be an end to the war. Uh, I happen to frankly think that there's not really a problem uh, with the idea that Russian grain, Russian production, Ukrainian production, these things, as, as, as has been said, including by the Russian government, they want to participate. And so the ending of war in the favor of feeding the world, this is a crusade that I believe that a lot of people should begin to get into and, uh, and it may solve a lot of other problems. Marsha, any final thoughts? Yes, the, as you said, there is no more uh, exemplary example of what's in the common interest of people who seem opposite than food, breaking bread together, the rice bowl together. And I think the watchword is uh, for, can we avert the famine that's definitely otherwise coming and here in certain places already, is get together one and figure it out, number two. We can figure it out, we have the science. And it's a question of the financial and the social organization and backing nations having the sovereignty to, to try for food self-sufficiency. And I'll give one concrete example. We're succeeding in, uh, in finding a way that you don't have to plant rice, for example, widely eaten around the world every year. We can have perennial rice. It's being, field tests are being done in Africa. It's being developed in China. Isn't that a breakthrough? There is no, there are no limits to the growth in the production of food. It's just this question of creating conflict among people that's causing the danger. And finally, one nice image, you know, uh, the Russian president, Vladimir Putin was 70 years old this month in October. So he was in St. Petersburg with some people and one of which was the president of the neighbor, neighboring country, Belarus, Mr. Lukashenko. And what did he give his neighbor, Putin for his 70th birthday? He gave him a tractor, a farm tractor. He gave him a gift certificate for a big red tractor that's made in Belarus. They're famous. The biggest tractor factory in the world is in Belarus. Uh, John Deere makes more of them out in the Midwest, but so I, I, there's more, uh, that's symbolic of a lot of things. We need manufacturing, we need farming, and we need the opportunity for people to be productive. That's the joy that comes, and we can work together on that. Thank you. You've been listening to Marsha Berry Baker and Dennis Speed. This is... Um, issues that matter. So if you like this show, please subscribe to my YouTube page. Thank you. This has been a great um, interview. And, you know, I think in, in, in the coming weeks and months, we could talk more about food. This is terrific. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for listening. Have a great day.